Welcome to this NMRA PCR Coast Division eClinic. It's a recording of Mike Lane discussing his passion for the Virginia and Truckee Railroad and how he's built a model based on the prototype and on photos. Um, and we're going to go ahead and let Mike uh, share his screen. And once he gets that going, then we'll start and have him uh, talk to us a bit about his modeling passion. Okay, well, thanks for the invite here. Now, I originally prepared this clinic uh, to be given at the annual meeting of the Virginia and Truckee Historical Society in Carson City, Nevada. I've been attending historical conferences and historical symposiums on the VT and Western Railroad since the 1980s. But now I had volunteered to take over the role as a moderator of the modeling section of the meet from Dave Connery. So the modeling section kicks off the annual society meeting, and it's really popular and well attended. Uh, asking around for what to present, somebody finally said to me, well, how, how did you come to model the Virginia and Truckee Railroad? And that was a good question. I had to think about it. And then looking through, thinking about my past, I was thinking I've been working towards modeling this railroad my entire life. I just didn't realize it at the time. So a little background. I'm sure you guys have uh, photo books like this. Mine's filled with pictures of me and my sister on all kinds of train engines. I grew up in Chicago area, so there were plenty of railroads to be seen. And, uh, and I made the annual trip to Disneyland to visit relatives out here in San Jose every year. And I also attended the anniversary of the Electromotive Division plant in LaGrange, Illinois. That was quite of a interesting, uh, interesting visit as a kid. Um, they had just constructed their 5,000th locomotive here, as you can see on this, uh, on this side of this building. It was also the 100th year anniversary of the Great Locomotive Chase. And, and that was a movie I'm, I'm sure a lot of us saw when we were kids. And they brought the general here. Here's a picture of me standing in front of the general with my sister. So I remember a childhood filled with wonderful trains and visiting every train we can find. My sister, my sister, remembers being dragged to all these trains. So her experience may differ from mine. It was a little different than mine, but I, I had a great time. Can you hear me okay? Okay. All good, you're doing great. Okay. So I, I, just a, a couple more slides. One thing I had in my, in my backyard when I was a kid was a little antique roller coaster my grandfather bought me. I don't know if you can see this. He climbed up about four feet, got on this little wooden cart, and rolled down. Uh, I got this from my grandfather, and it was quite a scandal at the time because I was the only grandchild that year that got a present. It may have had something to do with me uh, uh, being the only uh, kid who, he, this guy, he was an old Polish guy. He from the old country, very old school. And for his birthday, we went to a Polish restaurant. And I was the only grandkid who was brave enough to try his favorite soup, which is called charnina, which is kind of a chicken dumpling soup seasoned with chicken blood. So I was the only kid who was brave enough to try that. And I was the only kid who got the uh, Christmas present that year, this old roller coaster. So I guess I knew how to play the uh, grandfather card at the time. I also remember taking my cat for a ride down this roller coaster. I thought my recollection is the cat loved it. My mother told me that after the first time the cat went down the roller coaster, went up on the roof for two days and wouldn't come down. So I guess, uh, I guess I remember that one a little differently too. So let's see. So I, I really owe uh, my interest in Western railroading to my father. Here's a picture of my father. Loved Western railroads. He became interested in railroads in Chicago. He lived only a few blocks from the uh, Milwaukee Road main line. And as a kid, used to climb up the embankment, watch the Hiawatha and steam era Hiawatha fly by at 90 miles an hour. And he was always willing to uh, explore the West and, and uh, railroading. And he's the one who taught me that uh, Western railroading was really a magical subject. So I owe a lot to my dad. So I grew up strong in Chicago, developed an interest of astronomy and geology and paleontology and uh, won some science fairs. I ended up marrying my uh, high school sweetheart. I've been married for 44 years. And I had, uh, the future looked so bright, I had, I had to wear shades, you know, it was, it was like that. Uh, and then this happened. I had become a geology major at Northwestern University 
And I signed up uh, to do some field work to help, help some graduate students do field work when I was an undergraduate. Now my parents had always my parents had always fantasized fantasized about the mystery of the West. But then when I volunteered to go camp out in the Nevada desert for an entire summer, all of a sudden, I'm sure this is what they thought. They said, you can't possibly go out there. There's scorpions and snakes and venomous reptiles. You'll never make it, despite the fact that they encouraged me to have an adventurous life. So I, I, I found this picture, and I imagine this is just exactly what they thought that would happen to me uh, when I went out there. But in reality, you know, coming from Chicago, the West was great. There was fresh air. There was old mining structures everywhere. You could drink out of the streams, which I did. I'm, a, I'm glad to be alive still from doing that. But anyways, my interest in uh, Nevada geology, I kind of leveraged into an entire career. And I spent uh, years looking for minerals and oil and gas in Nevada and then ended my career as a state geologist for the Utah Geological Survey. So I really uh, had, a, had a really interesting time. So by the time I was a geologist with the Utah Geological Survey, I, the lizards weren't chasing me, but I was chasing down the lizards. Here I am here in full Indiana Jones mode, and I uh, was able to volunteer to uh, dig up some dinosaurs. And uh, here we are digging up an iguanodon in uh, Mustn't Touch It in the 1950s, central Utah. So I was living the Western dream by this time. That's not how it started. When I volunteered to go out to Nevada, I entered my period, what I call total Nevada railroad immersion. This is where I really, this is where I really started to become interested in Nevada railroads. Now, the t when I volunteered to go out to Nevada, it turns out that the town that we were living in at the time was Mina, Nevada. They had rented a house in Mina, Nevada for the summer to conduct field work all over this area of Esmeralda County, uh, Candelaria, Mina, Sodaville, out in the Pilot Mountains. And uh, so I spent the entire summer out based in Mina and then looking at Candelaria, working in the Candelaria area. Now, for those who are familiar with the SP, the Mina was a, a really historic and interesting spot. At the time I was there, it was the end of a branch line of the SP that ended in Mina here. And the, every couple days, a, a uh, train would come down from the main line and spend the night there and load up with all kinds of evaporite minerals, tungsten ore, and uh, some mercury ore, some cinnabar ore from mines in the Pilot Mountains here. So I used to go down and watch the trains. And uh, I eventually, I could see when working in the Candelaria area that there were train grades all over the place. I was seeing railroads, but I didn't know much about them. I picked up a book in Hawthorne when I went to buy groceries one day, and all the, it was Slim, Rail, Slim Rails Through the Sand by George Turner. So all of a sudden, I, I knew where I was, and I could follow all these railroad grades. And uh, so I was deep in what I didn't know at the time um, was that what I, well, I, what I discovered was that it was part of the Carson and Colorado Railroad, which, you know, is like the child of the Virginian Truckee. So that was really my first contact with the VNT was living in Mina and, and spending a whole summer working in this area out here. July 4th weekend, the uh, professor who was in charge of us uh, rented us a place. We went in the mountains near June Lake to spend the weekend. And we, we drove from Mina to June Lake and we followed the grade and they knew I was, a couple of the guys were knew, knew I was interested in railroad. So we actually rode on part of the grade up to, through basalt and up through the summit. And if you're riding in a car with a bunch of geologists and you see a tunnel, we went through it. So we actually climbed through the summit tunnel of the, of the uh, old SP narrow gauge. So this was, you know, the Virginia, Carson in Colorado became the SP narrow gauge going down into Owens Valley here. And there's a tunnel at the summit. We, we actually managed to climb through it. Went on the Benton, stopped at Benton Hot Springs, went sitting in the, uh, went skinny dipping, I should say, probably in the, uh, the hot springs there like college kids do. We ended up later in the Bishop on the way back, and that was my first trip to Laws where I saw SP narrow gauge number nine. So that was the first narrow gauge and first Western steam engine I had really seen. So that was my introduction to, to railroading in the Great West. And everywhere I went, 
I uh, uh, let's see if we can get this to change. There, everywhere I went, I carried a box of books. I started my collection of Nevada Railroad books. And you can see these are the actual books I took out in the field. You can see they're totally worn from bouncing around in cars. I became really interested in the Silver Short Line by Ted Worm. And I actually had met Ted and heard him give some talks actually before the book came out. And I started, I actually started corresponding with Ted Worm. Um, I got up at the time, he was kind of my hero. He had actually lived and, and seen the VNT in action. And he had, he had his, his uncle, his maternal uncle was an engineer on the UP. I mean, I mean, on the VNT and used to go there every summer. So I, I got up enough bravery to write him a letter. I asked him just a few hundred questions I had about the VNT. He promptly deflated my balloon by writing a, me a letter back complaining that I hadn't sent him any money for a return postage. So I was, I sent him, I sent him 10 bucks, I think in a check and, and the rest was history. We became great pals. We wrote, we wrote a number of letters and I was able to ask him all kinds of questions on the VNT. It was pretty interesting. I even at, actually, uh, had the honor of, uh, of buying him lunch in Carson City during one of the early symposiums. Um, so that, that was interesting. He was a cantankerous old guy, but he, he loved the VNT, that's for sure. So that was, that's where I began to really formulate my ideas on the VT, VNT. When I asked him about the Virginian truckee, let's see, is this good? There we go. I sat down with him. Oh no, that's not the that's the wrong one. Hold on, I went twice. Let's see if we can start this over. Sorry, folks. Let's come on. Yes. There we go. So I had this map when I was eating eating lunch with uh, with Ted Worm, and I asked him about modeling the VNT. Now, for everybody, I'm sure is pre here is pretty familiar with the VNT, but it was originally built to bring ores down from Virginia City, the great Comstack low, down to the, um, the mills down by the Carson River here. And then eventually it was connected to Carson City and then the Southern Pacific mainline in Reno. And then uh, later in the 19th century, early 19th century, the line was extended down to this uh, farming uh, area and ranching area down to Minden. When I asked uh, Ted what part of the VNT was worth modeling, he, he said all of it, which was a great answer, but not really helpful um, <laughs> if you're trying to model the railroad. But uh, that's the kind of enthusiasm he had. But I needed a sign. And when I moved to San Jose, I had spent several weeks looking for houses. No houses here have basements, of course. And then I, I wasn't finding a good house until I saw an ad for a house on Comstock Way. And I thought, well, surely that's that's a sign. That's some kind of divine sign that that house is worth looking at. And sure enough, it was a mid-century modern house that had a two and a half car garage, this little space on the side here. I figured it would be just right for a train layout. And it turns out it was, that's where my train layout is. We ended up buying this house and still live here now. So I needed a sign and I got a sign. But uh, then I needed a miracle and I got a miracle. When I was in uh, visiting Virginia City and Carson City in Reno one summer, near my birthday, we, I walked into a hobby store in Reno, and this was on the shelf, VNT number 25. And this was in the early 90s, I believe. And it was really rare to find painted locomotives back then, for painted brass locomotives. So I, I thought this was a miracle. And then sure enough, uh, my wife, you remember her from the earlier photo there, she ended up buying me this from, from my, uh, for my birthday. So this was really getting me on the road to modeling the V&T. So I reckon there's a couple of ways about going to do modeling. You can, choose, you can choose an era and then hope you can find the equipment or you can use what you have and go from there. And that's kind of the way I chose. I had this, now I tried to do some research here to figure out what I could do with this engine painted in this scheme. And that's how I went forward. Let's see. So I looked, I did some research on number 25 and found out that every Wednesday and Saturday, it put a train together in Carson City of what was going on, uh, the freight that was available and headed out on the road up to Virginia City. 
So that was really the key as to what I could do with this engine. Without any modifications at all, this engine was perfect for modeling the Virginian Truckee in the, in the, in the 30s and its annual and its uh, weekly runs up to Virginia City. So that's the way I proceeded. So the Virginia City, looking at what, what you could model on Virginia City, the line really enters here on the left, an American flat going through some snow sheds, comes across American flat, crosses the Crown Point trestle, goes through the old mining town of Gold Hill, comes through the deep mining area here and enters Virginia City going through some more mines, crosses, goes through a tunnel underneath St. Mary's of the clouds and enters the Virginia and Truckee yard here below the main part of Virginia City. So Virginia City is just a, a really interesting mining area. I've been slightly underground in a few mines here. The original deposits of the Comstock load were discovered up above the town. And it was dipping in towards Mount Davidson here, which is up to the top of the hill here. So it was actually uh, extending to the uh, Northwest. The mine was dipping to the West, but then when they got deeper, the actual ore deposit curled around along a fault and actually ended up coming down through the town at about a 45 degree angle. From about here down here, it extended actually about 40 degrees at a 40 degree angle going down deep. So the mine, the original mines, that, so it was originally mined here until it started going under the town. And then they built a, a series of other mines that intersected the load at a shallower depth. Eventually they got down to about a thousand feet and they drilled a, a whole series of other speculative uh, mines farther out where the, the ore body was very deep and it was not very successful out there. So this is the area I would try to model. Somehow I would try to cram this in to my little uh, uh, space in my garage. So that was gonna be a challenge. And I decided that I would, uh, let's see, change here. There, oh, went too far again. Sorry, it's got a slow response. And there we go. So I, I decided that the best thing I could do is gather up my favorite photographs of key areas from the Virginia and Truckee and see what they see what they presented themselves. The line appears out of, in American flat by coming through some snow sheds here. And here you can see a fan ship. Here's a shot of the number 11 coming through the snow sheds. There was a water tank at Scales, at a place called Scales, a very typical Virginia and Truckee square water tank. And then the famous Crown Point trestle. No layout of the V&T in the Virginia City area would be complete without having some kind of model of the Crown Point trestle. Then the line went through Gold Hill. It was a great depot. The line was actually serviced by Gold Hill. And this is a picture actually taken by Ted Worm where he uh, was on the last revenue freight train that went up to uh, Virginia City to get some, to pull this boxcar out loaded with some sacks of ore. That's a picture he took. So the VNT ran through Gold Hill and at that time there were some great old buildings. This old uh, uh, Gold Hill Hook and Ladder Company here, an old livery, and this uh, Nevada, I mean this the uh, uh, Miners Union building here. And just to make it interesting, the railroad actually ran through these, these buildings here. So I thought, well, that, that's, that's worthy of consideration here. Then of course, there were still lots of mining structures in Virginia City, head frames, tramways, and the railroad as it entered Virginia City also crossed under some interesting trestles where ore was brought out from the mine shafts into some loading bins that were covered, I think probably to protect them from freezing and snow. So that was an interesting and unique part of uh, Virginia City. And then it entered the Virginia City yard proper coming through a shallow tunnel into the Virginia City yard and depot and freight depot, which is still there. And you can see that the town, that the yard is actually below Virginia City. It's an interesting perspective. And I thought that would be time, an interesting thing to try to model. So there was no time to waste. I was building this layout just about the time the NMRA 2000 convention in San Jose was announced. And uh, I had started the layout, but it, I had about 10 months to this, to this, uh, to the convention. 
And a friend of mine, Mark Cook, and I decided that we were show them how it's done. We were full of ourselves back then. We decided we're going to put this lab, we're going to finish this lab, and we will display it at the convention, which we did. Thank God to Mark for helping me. So we built this layout, which you're going to see in about 10 months of work. And uh, we spent a lot of time working on it. And since then, it's it's been open to a bunch of uh, every tour that I've that's gone by the area, including the Santa, the National Narrow Gauge Convention, the extra to 2011. And now I, every every time it's out, I I put this uh, sign out in front. It's starting to look like a a Roman legion standard with all the battles that it's won coming through through the ages here. So uh, first, and I'm going to show you what kind of we accomplished here in a couple months. Let's see. Uh, there we go. Oh. Let's see if it's going to cross here. That doesn't seem. Let's try it again. There it goes. All right. No, nope, that's the wrong one. Damn. Okay. So here's the photo that I chose to model. These were going to be my guidelines. And here's a photo from my model here. Here shows number coming. Here's the layout, the, the, the train entering the layout room from the garage. The snow shed at American Flat. Here's what it looks like on the outside. Here's my representation of the train coming out. Number 25 on its way up to Virginia City, coming out of the American flat snow sheds. Crosses, uh, and here's the uh, here's a picture of scales. Here's a, a typical, very prototypical Virginia and Truckee square water tank. And I was trying to duplicate this photo taken by Ted Worm. That's his that's his maternal uncle, Grover Russell, was an engineer. And here here's a representation of that photo on my Virginia and Truckee layout. So I thought that was pretty neat, the way that came out. And of course, no railroad would be complete without the Crown Point trestle. And here's the Crown Point trestle on my layout. I never tire of watching trains run over the, the trestle there. Here's beautiful number 25 on its uh, weekly trip. Train entering uh, Gold Hill. And uh, it, look, it looks, I just love watching trains go over the trestle and enter the town. Yeah. So I think that came out okay. Then there's the town of Gold Hill itself. I, here's, a, there's the depot. And here's, I scratch built these uh, structures through Gold Hill, just like you see in the photograph here. That's what we were able to do there. And remember, it goes through the buildings here. And here's the picture of the engine going between the buildings with the uh, Gold Hill Hook and Ladder Company, number one, the old livery, the uh, Nevada uh, Miners Union building, and then the Homestead Mine in the background up in the hills. Trying to capture the, the feel and experience of being in Gold Hill. Head frames, I had, to, I had to model the head frames. Here's the train going through the deep mining area. These are some of the deep mines, the Yellow Jacket mine. And uh, there's still some little exploration going on. The guy's trying to get the steam engine working here for the hoist and do some exploratory mining here. Tramways, I, I had to find a reason to use all these little ore collect cars I collected through the years. So here. I managed to get a mine in through the deep one of the deep mines. The train entering Virginia City, going through one of these uh, little tramways. It goes over the main line to one of the the ore bins up here to collect ore, to keep the snow off the ore. And then the train entering Virginia City. I tried to duplicate this photo. Tried to get the feel of this. As the, it actually goes through this shallow subway here. It's, it's kind of a tunnel, but it's only a few feet under the ground. The street's right above it. But you can see it comes out of the tunnel. There's St. Mary of the Clouds in the back. And here's my picture. Big poplars here. I tried to get those poplars here. Here's the uh, St. Mary of the Clouds. And here's the train, number 25, emerging from the tunnel into the main VNT yard. And here we go. There's a train coming through the tunnel. 
through the depot here and you can see Virginia City in the background here up high. I'll talk, I'll talk more about that in a minute here. And here we go. So then when the train enters the yard, it takes some time to do some switching in the yard. Now you can get a grasp of how I tried the model of Virginia City here. Here you can see it up on the hill, the yard down below, freight depot and uh, switching cars around. There still was some freight. Now the Comstock was going through quite a change in mining from underground mining to open pit mining in the, in the mid to late thirties. And it, the change to open pit mining caused kind of the last little rush of traffic up to Virginia City as the mining switched. Most of the traffic and freight traffic up in Virginia City at the time was was due to lumber. There was a lot of lumber being used to offset the to fill up the mines and keep the mines open because the, the, the Comstock load was quite a thick deposit, 20 to 40 feet thick. So it all had to be shored up with lumber. And even late in the game, they were still maintaining the mines. Gasoline was, was a regular shipment and less than carload freight and carload freight coming to the free freight depot. So there still was some residual switching left that, that could be modeled on the line. And I tried to incorporate all that. The yard itself, if you were hung out in the yard for a day, you could savor the city and maybe, maybe catch one of the rare appearances of uh, the McKean car, which actually didn't travel up there too much, but there is an account of it traveling once or twice up to uh, Virginia City. But I think it had a long overhang and took off the corner of a building in Grand in Gold Hill or something like that. That's, that's the rumor I heard. I don't know if it's true, but it, it's a good story. So here's, here's what the layout room actually looks like. It's when people see it after they've seen the photograph, they're sometimes surprised how small it is. It's only seven feet by about 14 feet wide. So it's actually, no, it's not seven feet. It's five feet by 14 feet wide. It's only five feet wide here. The line enters the layout room here on the left, comes through the snow sheds at American Flat. Here's the scales depot, crosses the, the uh, uh, Gold Hill trestle, the Crown Point trestle, sorry, into the town of Gold Hill, which I modeled here. Here's some of the deep mines in the divide area here. Here's this is, I call this area the divide. There's St. Mary of the Claus. Then the train comes and enters the uh, yard proper here. Looking from the yard the other way, you can see the tra track comes out here into the yard, into a highly condensed version of the VNT yard at, Go at uh, Virginia City. And underneath and up above is my representation of, of uh, Virginia City. And I'll talk a little bit more about trying to capture the feel of, of, of a city this size on a small layout like this. For modeling purposes, the tracks continue around this bend, duck under the trestle here, and then actually go underneath the town over here. And then switching up to the north, it, it comes out here. There's a crossover here allowing engines to be turned, but the main track goes out along the back wall here and out of the building into a fiddle yard that's in the, actually on a shelf in the garage before it returns around. So it's really restricted to the operations from American Flat up to Virginia City. But remember, I only had nine months to build this in limited space, and I really wanted to capture the feel of Virginia City. And that's, that's how I did it. It's quite crammed in there, but it's built scene by scene. Here's a good perspective of the Virginia City yard and it was quite empty at the time. So it's hard to, it takes some restraint to not fill it with models. It still needs to have that kind of empty open feel. And Virginia City itself in the thirties was almost a ghost town. There was very little activity. It was the pre, pre uh, commercial area like it is now. It was just an abandoned old mining town, but you can see, I think I captured the look of the field. Most people who see the layout instantly know and think that it looks like Virginia City and, and that's no accident. It was the layout was built with uh, uh, L girder framework, a big drop here for the Crown Point trestle here through the ravine. The scenery was carved by my friend out of styrofoam. My, my friend Mark Cook actually took the time to carve all this uh, all this uh, styrofoam and shape it and then we painted it. And then I had collected uh, buckets full of actual gravel from the Virginia City area and different expeditions I took to go there. And uh, we collected uh, samples from the tailings and 
rock outcrops and then sifted it with highly expensive geological uh, <laughs> sifting equipment I had access to and got different sizes. I'm sure it's giving off radon. It's full of lead and arsenic. I think the whole layout's probably a toxic waste site because all this stuff came from the, the mines in Virginia City. But I think the overall uh, overall look is pretty good. It has a really deep fascia here, uh, which I thought I wanted to make this fascia. And it's painted with this color, uh, Palomino tan. And everything on the layout is kind of washed with this tan to give it kind of a Western dusty look to it. And so that was no accident either. Everything's kind of muted and tamed by washing it with this overall wash here. Another view of number 25 leaving Gold Hill. Let's see. So almost all the structures here were scratch built. The uh, Crown, uh, the Gold Hill Depot was um, was modeled was scratch built from uh, plans from the uh, Narrow Gauge and Shoreline Gazette. To save time, the sand, the roof was just big sheets of uh, balsa wood sanded together at the corners. Remember, I was in a hurry to do this, so there was some expedience, and it's held up really well. So that's just plywood sheets sanded to fit. I always had trouble figuring out the angles of these corners. And the town, all these, these structures in Gold Hill that were, were pretty much scratch built from photos. I would, I would purchase the doors and then scale the buildings from the doors and windows, work backwards from there. Here is the uh, miners union hall and then the uh, homestead mine up on the hill here. And actually, this is just a few inches away. This is built in N scale, uh, the, the mine up here. So it's actually it's it's actually quite a bit smaller than the EHO stuff, but from the photographs, it gives it an interesting perspective, makes it look a little farther away. And I'm hoping that works. It works good in the photos and when you're there looking at it. And the train. And the divide area, I tried to capture, the divide area allows you to kind of see a street of what Virginia City looked like. And you can see it was pretty empty and abandoned at the time. Here's Bob coming home from his first drink in the morning from one of the local bars. And here's a woman, uh, I have stories for all the people on the layout. This woman's waiting for her divorce in Reno, rented a cab to take her up to Virginia City. She's uh, she's doing some sight, early sightseeing, look at some of the abandoned stores. Here's the hotel Mark Twain here in the streets. And here's the train running and crossing underneath the divide before it enters uh, Virginia City. Okay. Let's go. So one of the big influences, one of the things I was reading while I was building this lab was this book, The Big Bonanza. Uh, by Dan DeQuill. I don't know if you're sure with, familiar with that, but that was the pen name of a gentleman named William Wright, who was the editor of the Territorial Enterprise, the newspaper in Virginia City. And he was Mark Twain's boss when Mark Twain worked in Virginia City. It had always been rumored that uh, Mark Twain was one of the ghostwriters in this book. And when you read it, you can believe it because it's just full of great and humorous tales. So th this book was a big influence on me on trying to capture the, the feel of a Western town and what it would be like to live there. Sure enough, it's the Big Bonanza, an authentic account of the discovery, history, and working of the world-renowned Comstock Lode of Nevada, including f the frequent condition of various mines situated therein, sketches of the most prominent men interested in them, incidents and adventures collected with the mining, the Indians, the country, amusing stories, experiences, antidote, etc., etc and a full exposition of the production of full silver. This is a great book to read. Another thing that captivated me, it has a, a wonderful set of woodblock paintings that are uh, woodblock carvings and prints that are just really detailed and wonderful. I spent a lot of time looking at them. And uh, let's see, it's gonna go. And you, you meet all kinds of characters, Kit Carson, Sarah Winnemucca, and Comstock himself, and the most unlikely story of the discovery of the load, apparently the Grosch brothers actually discovered the Comstock load up above the city, up here and identified the, uh, the silver sand, the black sand. Comstock appeared one day, claimed that he had the water rights and had discovered this previously, he came down every day bothering the Grosch brothers, claiming 
they were claim jumping. And to shut them up, they, uh, they gave them an interest in the claim just to get rid of them. And apparently it worked. And uh, Comstock's name actually got applied to the Comstock load, the famous silver deposit. But he, he actually did almost none of the work himself. But so he just kind of leached on and onto the whole story. And uh, I spent a lot of time looking at these wonderful blocks, the road up to, through Devil's Gate, Silver City, the old pictures of uh, Virginia City itself, the mining structures and the railroad coming into Virginia City, going through the trestles uh, where ore was brought out to the mountain and dumped on the other side of the tracks here. Gives you kind of a perspective. I really like this. And by the time you finish reading this book, you really feel like you're there. I even used some of the wood blocks as a basis for kit bassing structures on the lab. This is the H. Uh, Donnelly, the foreman of the Belcher Mine Residence. And I incorporated kind of an interpretation of that sketch into building this building. Yeah. So by the time you're, you're done reading this book, you feel like you're one of the guys sitting on the porch in Virginia City. Here's, here's the boys sitting back and relaxing. Two bird cages here with canaries singing, a little light up here. So I really felt like uh, I was one of the boys after reading this book. Highly recommended. Then, of course, when you go to Virginia City, um, it, I mean, I, I, I had the pleasure of being able to go there and do research and trying to model the town itself. And I remember one of my early visits, I, I saw this sagebrush and silver. And I, I, at first, I thought it was just going to be a worthless uh, a guide to Virginia City. But it's actually anything but that. It's really smartly written and a great historical guide to the buildings and architecture of Salt Lake. And I didn't realize it at the time of Salt Lake, of Virginia City. It's the best, uh, turned out to be one the best dollar ninety five I, I I think I ever spent on a book. It's just full of old photographs, many which of which I hadn't seen. Um, and some of them were actually from the 1930s, the actual period I was modeling. It's really hard to find pictures of Virginia City and what it looked like at the time that I'm modeling it. And also, I, did, I didn't appreciate at the time, I see it had a, a guide of all the buildings on C Street in Virginia City, C Street and B Street. And I didn't realize till later on that if you connected all these, these drawings together, you had a pretty good idea of what the actual streets in Virginia City looked like. And in fact, I ended up using this to model Virginia City. I, I tried to get, I either bought kits or kit bashed buildings to look at this sequence of buildings. This sequence here, through here and through here, I used to model Virginia City. And uh, I may not have got the buildings 100% correct, but I got the style and type of buildings and approximate height, number of windows, and which, uh, which one had the old wood buildings, which had the brick, which blocks had the brick buildings, and put it together. So the model of Virginia City I strove for actually had some reflection into actual architectural uh, uh, construction of the city. So this this turned out to be really a helpful a guide for $1.95. And I also had this photograph, which I chose to keep in mind as the perspective that I was trying to choose. The, the, the V&T comes out of the tunnel here, goes past the depot, past the car shed, over to the uh, freight depot. You can see loads of wood. Here's number 25 switching here and lots of fresh wood being unloaded, still trying to prop up the mines, even though the mines were in the process, they would be only a few years before they were totally abandoned, but they're still bringing in wood to shore up the, the, the uh, mine so that it doesn't collapse. And here's Virginia City overlooking the yard here. And here's some of the original mines here, the earlier mines that I talked about where it's discovered above the towns. They initially, the ore deposits inclined towards the mountain then rolled underneath and went down this way. So the entire Virginia City downtown is actually held up by wood, these wood pilings underneath the city. Because there's a 20 to 30 foot, sometimes 40 foot rooms of ore that have been deposited under the city and mined out. So the whole city is being supported on these wood tailings. And there's noticeable shrinking and, 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 and collapse of several areas. It's, it's quite a problem. Uh, also to model the, the Virginia City, I, I, I collected old postcards and photographed postcards. Got a lot of data from these. 
you can see in this picture, probably taken in late 30s, early 40s, Virginia City still has a dirt street. You can see all the original buildings are still there. The streets lined with telephone and power lines on both sides. Most of the structures still have their old original wood porches. Just a few signs still left here. And they have this, these interesting rain gutters. This area is, uh, as all of the basin and range is uh, subjected to uh, flash floods and torrential downpours. And apparently this just took the water out from the top of the buildings. And instead of going behind them and then moving downhill through them, it dumps the water onto the street. So this was something that would have to be captured if you're trying to capture the mood of Virginia City. Here's the other side. Here's the south side of the uh, uh, west side, rather, of uh, C Street still has the, the gutters. Some of the early uh, tourist uh, bars being developed here. So that was postcards were a great source of uh, the architectural details. And then also um, color postcards. Well, these are a slightly later area, probably the 40s, early 50s. It does show the colors the, that were of the buildings. Some of the old signs are still there. And you can see the, the limited palette of colors, reds, some whites, everything kind of washed over and kind of yellow. I kind of interpret this as being washed over kind of <laughs> aged yellow here. But I got a lot of color information from these old uh, postcards. Here's a, here's a look at C Street that I model. The old dirt street, telephone and power lines visiting, uh, lining both sides of the street. The old brick buildings, the sequence of which I got from those architectural cross sections, hand lettered buildings here. And of course, the really unique rain gutters coming across. All this adds to kind of giving the feel of uh, Virginia City on the layout. And also, you have to keep in mind, you have to keep the streets part <laughs> free of details because it was pretty empty at the time. Here you can see uh, the upper part of the C Street here, part of B Street. And here, here's the lower part down here. Here's the old wood buildings and the sequence that I, I got from that uh, cross section and part of B Street up ahead. Most of the buildings are kitbashed. Some are scratch built structures. Some are commercial kits. I changed the angle on some of the corners of the buildings to give kind of a, so that the perspective from viewing the, uh, you could, viewing the layout, uh, viewing the city from the layout, you could look up the streets. There's a, sh a kink in the streets here. And that's so that if, when you're standing in the layout, you can look up the street here. Some, this building here, for example, I saw in a photograph and it looked like just to be made out of uh, the local stones and gravel in the area and cemented together. So that was kit bashed. That was kit bashed. And they, these buildings were kit bashed from commercial kits, added porches. This one was fused together. This one I added another story. But it all worked out to give kind of the, the feel of the, the Virginia City architectural style and, and look uh, that I was going for at the time. Here you can see what it looked like to look up the the little kink in the street allows you from the layout to look up the street here. Makes it look like a lot bigger city. I think I built, I think there's 55 buildings on the layout. And I've seen Chicago modeled with less buildings. So this was quite an effort to kind of maintain this look. It was the largest city between Denver and San Francisco for a while. And uh, that's why you, when you go there today, it, it still has quite a lively uh, main street here. And you can see a lot of these old Victorian area structures too. There's just beautiful. A lot of them are commercialized now, but you can definitely get an idea that this was once a big place. Here's the uh, lower end of uh, the north end of C Street here. I added a little license here by putting in one of the more modern mills at the end next to one of the old mills. Here you can see the upper part of B Street I model. And uh, we've got some donkeys here drinking some water. And here over here on the right, you can just see the tracks of the line here entering this almost hidden tunnel here where the track goes underneath the town. So you, I can have some continuous running if I want, which is nice if you have visitors. Here's again, the, the city. Now I built this module, remember I, I built this module in about three or four months of work and the whole thing comes out. It actually comes out along these arrows here. This whole thing lifts out, it was built, it was built externally and then dropped in. And, and uh, even the 
the scenery here, even the gravel here collected from Virginia City area was was added. And this fence here kind of hides the, the suture line. So I, I brought this out in case equipment underneath ever got caught under the tunnel or I wanted to maintain the structure. But since 2000, this thing has never come out. <laughs> I do manage to lean over and dust it or vacuum it, but it's it's been in place. But here you get a good grasp of what uh, Virginia City trying to capture the spirit and look of Virginia City on my layout. Okay, so it was quite it was quite a it was quite a job, and of course, the saddest uh, photo to replicate on my lap was the last train to leave Comstock. Here's a photograph of the last. Uh, commercial train in 1938, revenue train to leave. Although there's still a boxcar here, I noticed. They must have come and picked that up sometime. And here's here's my model of the uh, Virginia Truckee, last engine to Virginia City, number 25, getting ready to leave. Sad day, sad time. And then that's the end, the last train to leave. And uh, that's my talk as it stands. There we go. Okay. Very nice. Mike, that was excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Beautiful. That's some fantastic modeling. It's really great. Well, thanks. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty happy the way it came out. Um, it's been a lot of fun having that layout and building it in a separate room. I didn't really concentrate on that too much, but it's built in a separate room from the garage. Uh, that I had started before, you know, early on, uh, before the nine months, I had that already done. And that's really kept it, uh, it's kept it in great shape since 2000. I even left uh, to go to Utah for a project that was supposed to take two years. And I ended up being there for eight and a half years with a special project with the geologic survey. So that whole time it was kind of mothballed and uh, it kept it in really good shape. So even though it's 20 years old, it's uh, having a separate room in the garage there really has helped me maintain it. And uh, it's still operational. I hope to uh, have it open for the convention coming up. I'm not signed up yet, but uh, I'd certainly be willing to have it open. Yeah, that was really my question, Mike, was yeah, you're planning to have it open next year so we can all come. Because I think having seen it with you describing it that way, the thing that's really cool about this is when you go see a layout, you're there, but there are seven or eight other people there. People yeah. are looking around. You mill around. You just don't get – again because you don't have those pictures up when you open your layout saying, well, look at this and look at how this replicated. Yeah. You don't put them on the fascia because it just you don't yeah. do that. Getting this first and then going and seeing it, I can guarantee for everyone here, when you go see the layout, your view of it and thought process can be profoundly different than it would have been if you hadn't seen this video. Oh, that's a good point. I uh... – yeah, I really, I really try to apply uh, the photos as guidance, as you can see. I, I tried to duplicate, you know, it, it's an interpretation. All model railroads, of course, are interpretation, highly condensed. I mean, I couldn't, there's no way you could actually model Virginia City or virtually any yard that's real size. So it's highly condensed, but it kind of scene by scene tries to capture photos that I have. So, you know, it, it has, I think it, it has the right look. It's not just random structures put together, but it's it's structures put together from photographs to make individual scenes. So every every time you look or turn on the layout, it's a scene that's based on something real, you know, a real photo. So overall, I think it it has a great uh, great style. I had uh, I had a chance encounter with a gentleman from the Smithsonian Institution who paints backdrops and buildings for models there. And he was the guy that he, uh, I just by chance had a chance, I had a half hour discussion with him once and he was the guy that told me about muting the colors using a really limited spectrum of colors. Look at the photographs, he said, look how limit, you know, when you stand back and look at the photographs, the photos are taken of the city from hundreds of feet away. And, and, and there's really a muted struct, a, a limited palette of colors that are used. And then everything's kind of washed over. There's no blacks, there's no whites. And he also gave me the idea of washing a uniform color over everything. And that's the Palomino tan I use to cover everything, which blends it all together. Nothing stands out. It all blends together. It looks like a dusty old mining town. 
So any other questions or anything? No, I have to agree with Phil that um, when we when I'm able to see your layout in person, it's going to mean a whole lot more. And the way you presented it, I thought was great because um, I can I can picture what you're trying to do. You know, these these uh, limiting it to a few scenes based on photographs. Um, it's remarkable you got that done in under a year, believe. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I really uh, we really crammed. I, uh, Mark Cook, this friend who helped me, was a this is around 2000. He was a high tech headhunter. He came and set up a computer in my garage. <laughs> so he worked out of my garage and then we, I was between jobs at the time. So we spent about nine months working that, that like day and night to get that together and, and to finish it. Cause I said at the time we were just full of ourselves and we were going to, we were going to show them how it's done. We're, we're the pros from Dover. You know, we were going to show them how it's done, you know, and we were just uh, having a great time modeling and, it was a quite an interesting experience to get it ready for the convention. Well, I don't it's like uh, even with the uh, amount of time you spent on it, you, you you really focused on the details, especially that trestle. I mean, you, you said ten months. It looks like it could, you could have taken ten months to build the trestle alone. Well, um, you know, I took shortcuts wherever I could, uh, so I was actually able to find some commercial trestle bents that approximated the I. You know, I, I got commercial products where they would fit. You know, it's not, it's not, everything is not exactly prototypical. It's not built to exact prototypical. I found the closest buildings I can and use those. I didn't have the luxury of, of really, I still had to scratch build a lot of structures, but everywhere I could, because of the time limitations, you know, I took shortcuts. It's not an exact model. It's not as exact as uh, perhaps Dave Conry's Virginia and Truckee layout was i mean i i know he was quite a an actual uh proto his layout was really prototypically accurate where well, mine is kind of an impressionist view of virginia city you know it captured the view of the photographs i wouldn't get the ruler out and measure it too closely you know that's what i'll say but the overall effect i think is what i was after you know so lots of stuff were just scaled up from photographs you know i didn't have plans for a lot of the structures i had that architectural cross section of the town which i used for the sequence of buildings their approximate size um some of the <laughs> some of the some of the structures on c street that you only see the back of well the front isn't you know the front isn't modeled too detailed you know what i mean it's like a hollywood set you know what i mean you, you everything you can see is done but the parts you can't see well you know detail fades rapidly in, you know, on that part, but the overall effect I think is pretty good. So. Uh, I think you got a good effect. Um, I like the perspective forcing that you did with the mine up on the hill, a little smaller scale. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm ask uh, the B and C street things, they look like they might be sort of low relief and just a little bit compressed so that you don't have to take the whole space for a full building. And then you mentioned that some of them are only one-sided. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you also- I, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Perspective there too. So are there are the ones on the back street a little smaller, or are they all still full HO scale? Uh, yeah, I modeled C Street and then the upper street part of Upper Street, B Street. Those are all HO scale. I did change the angles on some of them, and you're right. Some of the buildings have been uh, reduced in length. You know, their front to back length to fit. I think, um, and then it's also built on an angle, which intersects the back wall. So some of them kind of get narrower and narrower as they get closer to the wall. And one building, the tallest building, the Washoe Club, Washo Club is basically just the front on the building, you know? And when I originally, uh, it appears in the V&T, I mean, it appears in the Short Line Gazette before the layout was done, just before the convention. And it has no trees on it. We didn't, at first we thought there weren't any trees in Virginia City until we started looking at the photographs and then we discovered there were tons of trees. There were tons of trees all over the place, but that's, the scene is so desert-like, you don't notice it at first. You think it's a desert, but when you start looking at the photograph, we had to go back and do a whole tree thing. We constructed a whole bunch of trees and put them on there. We noticed the poplars in front of the station for the first time we hadn't noticed. So, um, you know, having photographs Everything I do, and I continue to do, I, I build a lot of structures for the South Bay Railroad Historical Society at their layout there. I'm kind of the uh, structure guru there and scratch build a bunch of structures there. And uh, I, uh, 
I forgot where I was going with this, but uh, the experience I got from this layout has continued on, and I've I've come pretty good at quickly modeling buildings. I forgot my point, but anyways. Well, just it looks like uh, well, partly because it's such a small space, you don't have you have a limited number of uh, viewing perspectives too, so you can get away with a lot of stuff you couldn't if you walked yeah. all the way around the layout. You can, you know, I uh, I built it for me. You know, I thought I would be the only one. You know, I was a lone wolf modeler for years. You know, I, I you know, I'm the only one who's going to see this layout pretty much. It only fits four or five people at a time. So even when I'm open for convention. I usually have some of my other little layouts open. I have a couple other small layouts. I do a lot of really small micro layouts. So I usually have some other entertainment you know, for people coming to visit the layout while they're waiting. So I try to make it a multi, uh, you know, multi-event. I'm also a, a live steamer and I have an extensive elevated live steam layout in my backyard. So I usually invite friends to come and run some live steam engines during open conventions. So it's a it's a it's a train fest at at my house during open you know when I'm open so trains of all sizes and shapes behold yeah so excellent well I'll look forward to it yes yeah. you're all welcome and uh, I'm <laughs> in San Jose on Comstock how can you forget that I live on Comstock Way it's certainly a divine intervention there I knew that house was going to be great before I even saw it just by the address and. Yeah, I, I was a member of the MRA. I think I'm, I think my membership has lapsed here. I, I, since I went to I went in Utah from 2004 to 2012, and I haven't fully gotten back to all the societies I belonged to before I I, I was uh, doing this trip in Utah, this uh, project in Utah. We'll get you to come back. It's the oh I'm oh I'm back we're, now. We're getting yes, there. Yes. We're we're and, and by the way, for anyone who's planning to have their layout open for next year you know we're going to probably be doing this for another five months based on what i hear i think it's going to be the best shot the convention in fresno will be the first open event and that's in i think late march early april wow and really so good. you know we have four more months um which means we're probably going to do i think we had eight or nine more of these events on saturdays if you're going to have your layout open, you know, get contact me. I can help you and put a slide presentation together with your pictures, just like Mike did. And, and we'll position these because I think this is a great pre-watch. I think anybody who reserves a layout tour to go see Mike's layout next year, this should be put in and say, hey, watch this video beforehand. It'll make it a lot more interesting to look at the layout. So same thing for anyone else who's thinking about having their layout open next year. I. Yeah, I don't know if everyone wants to see my childhood pictures or not, but I was just trying to get some perspective of my personal journey. We've all have our personal journeys, you know, and, and that's when I realized I'd been built. I've been working towards this layout my whole life. I just didn't realize it at the time, you know, so I don't know if that was interesting or not. My wife didn't think that was appropriate for this, but I don't know. You guys will have to judge whether showing those pictures was was a good idea or not. I don't it's know. It's why you, it's why you do what you do. That's the explanation. If you just start with it, it's, there's no there's no reason for the passion. I mean, right. you know, if you're passionate about a general subject as part of what you do and you invest so much time in it, it's great knowing the passion. I'm I'm very cool with it. Yeah, I thought it was fantastic coming from Chicago. I love the you know oh. your roots are same as mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm from Chicago. You know, uh, when I when I got my car, my first car in Chicago when I was in high school. We, we looked in the phone book. There were 27 different railroads in Chicago, 27 different railroads to go look at. We tried to go find them all, but we never did. It was really difficult. There was no Internet. I mean, we we're literally using phone books to find the addresses of the yard offices and things to find them. I didn't have a good map of the railroads or anything. You know, it was it was really difficult to, to, to do that stuff. But Chicago is a hell of a town to be a rail fan in. And my father was a rail fan. And um he he was a real Chicago guy. He could talk his way into anything. He knew the talk. He knew how to talk the talk. I remember being going out with him as a kid, and we would go to a roundhouse, and uh, he'd start talking to him, and then you know five minutes later we're in the roundhouse, you know, and then we're walking in the diesels. I have a great experience. I have a great memory of 
being in the Milwaukee Road Roundhouse where all the commuter engines were being served, which were all F units and E units. And of course, I'm a little kid, like five or six. And what does a little kid have to do? I have to go to the bathroom. I had to go to the bathroom, of course. And the guy says, oh, yeah, OK, no time. So we're, we're actually in an E unit. And he takes me into the nose of the E unit where there's a bathroom. And I remember peeing, you know, in this nose of this E unit. It's one of my best memories as a kid. You know, I mean, what is a kid? Kids got to pee all the time. And I remember peeing in this E unit. I never forgot that. I, I barely remember anything else from the trip, but I remember that part. You know, anyway, so I've got all it was a great place to grow up. And my, my dad being a rail fan, he talked us in to all kinds of things that weren't open. Caboose rides. We used to get caboose rides on local freights and stuff. I, I don't know how he did it, but, you know, it, it was a different world back then in the early 60s, you know, early to mid 60s. Yep. So Chicago was great. Yeah, it was a great place to grow up. Lots of trains. More trains than you can shake a stick at, as they say. So cool. anyways, yeah. Well, thank you again. We all appreciate okay. it. Okay. You're welcome.